It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I am looking forward to talking with my guest today. Joining me is Josh Evans, SVP, Senior VP of Sales at Philosophy. Josh, how are you doing? Great, Andy. How are you doing today? Great. Well, welcome to Accelerate. So uh, take a minute, introduce yourself, maybe tell us uh, how you got your start in sales. Well, uh, let's see. It's been a while now. I got my sales. Uh, <laughs> you're not that old. You're not that old. <laughs> I uh, I got my start in sales, I guess the real start in sales, back at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, selling upsells and insurance on rental cars. So working which, at, an, at an airport? Uh, you know what? Actually, at a local office. Some of the time was spent at an airport, too. But yeah, slinging rental cars and slinging insurance for rental cars, which um, then I spent... I guess the first real sales sales job I had was actually in the car sales business, which quickly turned into um, carsdirect.com, right. selling leads and online advertising to car dealers. And then that, that became uh, the stepping stone into Velocify and selling software. So you joined Enterprise. Now, Enterprise is sort of legendary, I guess, for training people really well, you know, people straight out of school. Because I see a lot of people sort of that, that, are, that was sort of their entry, entry-level job. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I wouldn't trade my enterprise experience for anything. There's something about being a 22-year-old who um, doesn't exactly know what they want to do, but they know what they want to be in, quote-unquote, business. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you make them wear a suit every day. You make them interface with customers all day. You make them clean cars in their suit. You hold them to sales numbers. And so it's a really good uh, training ground for a little bit of everything. But I've had the opportunity to, uh, let's say, hire people with enterprise backgrounds at different points in my career. Um, and one of my favorite things about people that come through the enterprise program is enterprise teaches them how to make decisions um, and how to make decisions that are in the favor of the customer. And um, I think that's, that's just one of my favorite things about my experience in enterprises. I think I came out of it being a really logical and rational decision maker in a business setting. Well, you said very customer focused. I mean, enterprise is legendary with their use of net promoter score. That's right. That's right. They, uh, they kind of, I don't know if they invented it, but uh, yeah, we were back in my day, we were just convert. We still did a lot of stuff with index cards in, uh, in index card file boxes uh, they weren't that technologically savvy, but they knew exactly what they wanted to do on the customer service focus. And you could go a long way in that company um, with, uh, with driven by good results in the in the customer service. So that was a huge part of my career. Yeah. All right. Very interesting. So let's talk a little bit about Philosophy now. So tell us for people that aren't familiar with Philosophy, what you guys do and who you do it for. Yeah, I think we would consider ourselves the most complete sales acceleration platform. Whoa, lots, uh, of, lots of food for talk there. Okay. Lot, yeah, lots of, lots we're of coming, We're coming back to that one. Okay. So, you know, part of the fun is that sales acceleration has only been a thing for probably less than two years now. We spent, uh, we're an 11-year-old company. We spent the first nine years trying to figure out how to tell people what we did. There was one point in time at the very beginning when we actually told people we made robots that killed other robots, but, but that's, uh, that's, for, that's for a different time. Um, <laughs> what we think is important about a sales acceleration platform is we, you know, in this whole world that we're in now where we're shifting to inside sales teams and technology and sales stacks for these inside sales teams, uh, what we want to focus on is the communication that these sales teams have with their prospects. So it's it's when, right? You know, we all know the the how important it is to respond to leads quickly, right? That's uh, we've written many a white papers on it. That's our bread and butter. Um, but it's also about what you respond with. It's also about the channel with which you respond on, and that's why we think it's important to be a platform. Um, because you can spend a lot of money and a lot of mind share 
building out the perfect thing for email, the perfect thing for text messaging, the perfect thing for presentation. You can kind of do it. You could piece by piece by piece do it all, especially if you're a Salesforce CRM user. Mm -hmm. um, and what we the important part of the platform is we can kind of handle it all. And for any customer that might be completely invested in one of those more targeted solutions, for instance, email, we can we can actually work alongside of it and uh, make it make it better with some of the ways that we approach the sales process. Okay, so to you know, break that down a little bit then. So your primary users within a sales organization, more of the top of funnel sales guys, the BDRs, SDRs? Uh, no, I think another piece about uh, being a platform is that it should be everybody that is engaging with the customer. Okay. So that, that would include the LDRs, BDRs, SDRs, whatever account you're execs. calling it. Yeah, but both inbound and outbound. It's certainly the inside account exec. Um, Believe it or not, that may actually be the the user that we're most in tune with. Mm -hmm. But but there's a lot of things that we do for an out. You know, we we're not uh, exclusively inbound. We have a lot of sales teams that have outbound reps that use our functionality as well. So, you know, and and, and account management teams too. Anybody along that um, engagement cycle with it is actually talking to a customer and has to organize their day around talking to prospects and and that makes an impact on their success, we, we believe that we are um, valuable to, to each of those teams. Okay, so tell people then what, what it is you actually do that help them organize their, their day. I, and so it, funny enough, it's exactly what we do is we help them organize their day. So what we, <laughs> what, okay. what we, what we know uh, after 11 years is that in a sales process, there are the right things to do at any given point in time. So people talk a lot about when is the best time to call a lead or an opportunity or a contact? When is the best time to send an email? And when you look at it from a vertical lens or from an from a outside lens, it ends up being pretty similar depending on, yeah, pretty similar regardless of what prospect you're looking at talking to. And so our lens is much more around how do we prioritize based on what we know is going on in the process? And so what that means, kind of the end result for a rep is that if I have 120 leads or 50 accounts or whatever it might be in, mm -hmm. my, in my set of things that I could do today, what we know is that the data will tell us a story about which ones you should reach, which ones you should reach out to, when you should reach out to them, how that might prioritize against the other ones you could reach out to that time, and what the best um, and what the best channel is, you know, whether it's a phone call or an email, um, social, to make that contact happen. Now, and is this is this based on data in the system? You know, you're scraping what's in the CRM, Salesforce, and saying, hey, based on past history, this is the optimal timing. This is the optimal day, let's say, to to be following up. Yes. So it's it's about. Um, I think one of the key parts of our system is it looks at the data in our client's system and looks to use that data. That is not exclusive of data that somebody might use in a predictive algorithm, right? But a, pr um, a predictive external piece of data to us is just a piece of data that can be used in this prescribed engagement strategy. Okay. All right. So, um, so somebody, you know, sales rep comes in at the beginning of the day, turns on, turns on their system or on their mobile phone, whatever their situation is, and they're presented with, hey, these are the things that we should be prioritizing for accomplishing today. Yeah, I think the easiest way to illustrate it is to say, you know, I'm sure you go into your clients all the time and you probably sit with a uh, uh, whatever their version of a rep is and say, how do you get started? You know, how do you know what to do all day? And I would say that what we see when we go into prospects is the vast 90 plus percent, um, the rep sits down and the rep is choosing between some set of saved searches, right? They might have 10, they might have 20, they might have their own saved searches, but they're choosing where to go. Um, and once they get, once they click into that search, then they're uh, choosing what records they might, they're choosing the records within the search that they want to 
work on and in what order and what they want to do with them. So with Velocify as a rep, I would come in and I would have one, you know, truth, uh, one record of truth list that would take all of these different save searches and all of the records on all the save searches and through a set of rules, it would turn it into one list and would only show me the things that I should work on now and it would show me them in the order of priority that I should work on them and it would give me direction on what I should do with it, call, email, you know, do some other tasks, so on and so forth. So it's about combining it all in one place so as a rep, I don't have to make those choices. It's all there for me. Um, in a prescribed in a prescribed environment. So it seems like there's and this is not specific to Velocify, but it, it seems to me that there's always sort of a, a step missing in systems similar to yours, let's say, that are out there. And maybe you guys do this, but is okay. We we tell the rep, okay, this is what you should be doing, email, so on and so forth. But then it's that next level down to saying, and this is what the email should should say. So we look at emails, there's kind of two different buckets of emails for us. There's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's trigger-based emails, and then there's emails that a rep would send. And so depending on where you are in the sales process, uh, there's emails that you want to go out every single time regardless. Basic emails like, I just called you and left a message, or you know, we have an appointment that is scheduled for an hour from now, or tomorrow, or whatever. And so in Velocify, the approach we take is that those should be trigger-based emails that the rep doesn't have to think about sending, that the system is just sending in the background. They look like they're coming from the rep, um, and if they're responded to, they get responded back to the rep, but the system is just sending those out. And then, if you look, it, maybe even a little bit more up funnel with um, like, a, like a VDR, um, there's more, it, it takes a little bit more nuance and a little bit more rep decision. And so there, it's all, about, uh, it's all about giving the rep choices and maybe giving them three or four templates that they might choose from to send based on what they think is happening at that point in the process. But again, the, it, it's coming from templates that are pre-written, um, you know, in, in a lot of organizations, compliance actually matters, that are cl compliant, vetted, consistent with whatever the marketing message is so that sales and marketing are working together. And do you have the facility then to be able to support like an account-based messaging so the campaigns are account-specific? Oh, absolutely. So, um, in kind of the way Velocify works is whether it's triggered or whether it's a rep that hits some part of the process with a lead or an opportunity or whatever. And so we're deciding it could be one of these three templates. Well, all of that is based on rule sets that are using data that is coming from whatever object we're working on at that point in time. And so all of that data becomes available both to write that trigger or write that rule that says show this template now, but then you can also take data points from that record to use in the content of the email, kind of like you do in a mail merge. Okay. Yeah, so and back to the question I had sort of asked before is, is yeah. and this is where I think reps really need help. I mean, you're addressing a, a need and a pain point for sure, but at, at some level then, yeah, I like to ask a question, and here's the question I think every rep should know about every qualified opportunity in their pipeline. What can you do today? What value does the customer need from you today to move at least one step closer to making a decision? And I'm sorry. I said, I what, 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 what value? What value? What information, questions, whatever we you know, we'll have a broad categorization of value, but what value does the prospect need from you today to help them move at least one step closer to making a decision? And, and and they should they should know that answer for every prospect in their pipeline, right? What's the next step? What do I need to do next that will help the customer move closer making a decision? I think that's sort of the next thing that seems like we need to be able to help the reps with. It's just one thing to say, okay, we should be doing an email. But my question is, how do we get to that point where we tell them this is what the email should contain? Yeah, so um, I think that's right. I think it's I think that is a harder thing to solve for. And I wouldn't represent that we solve it for the top of the funnel, like the sales development reps. Well, right? actually, this is really an account exec issue, not not uh, sales okay. development reps, because sales reps they're you know they're engaging. Let's get a demo. Let's get a meeting. They're out of the picture pretty much, right? So this is really the account exec at any any stage. 
And this is one of the big problems that, that I see with the kind of execs in a broad, a broad sense in all the companies I deal with is that they really don't know the what, the what, you know, what's the next thing I need to do that's going to move the customer one step closer to making a decision. Yeah. Um, I, I, I agree with you. I think that's a challenge. Um, I would, what I would say that Velocify does really well. well I'm not, uh, yeah. I'm not saying you guys do it or should, should be doing it. It's more a question about how do we get there, right? How do we get there? Okay. So I think you first have to start with the kind of digital signal that the buyer is sending you. So Velocify 10 years ago, whatever it was, where we, when we were a lead management tool, we jumped on the whole, you have to, um, you have to respond to a web lead in under a minute in order to have success with it. And what I would tell you is, especially in the B2B world, that it, it has evolved from that being pretty specific to a new lead to that being on any signal that the buyer gives you. So what I mean by signal is a, 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 um, a buyer submitting a lead form is a signal that they sure. want to talk to you at that moment. A buyer opening an email is a signal that they potentially want to talk about that email that they just opened or, or, could, or it's likely that they're going to have questions about that email. It is, there are, there are tools out there where um, you're sending collateral or even, uh, even contracts that you redline. But all of these things that you send out to, um, to your prospects, if the prospects do something with them, then the reps get in an alert. And so I think having, having a kind of one place where the, a rep can digest that the, the fact that these alerts are coming in and, un, and then have it prioritized for them and understand that this person just did this, I think is the place that you have to start. And that has to become commonplace in order to get to where you're talking about of the actual what I want, uh, the, trying to guess what the prospect wants to talk about every time that they're engaging with me like that. Because so much of the engagement is happening when the rep's not talking to them in the first place. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah. And actually, yeah, that's the whole theme of my first book that I published back in 2011. Is this, we'll have to make sure you read it because it's, it's, uh, it's all about that, right? The, yeah. the, the primary way that you, it's called book called Zero Time Selling, the way that, I'm sure the audience has heard that before, is, is you know, the way you begin to differentiate yourself is through responsiveness. Right. And responsiveness is absolutely essential for for reasons that we can spend more time on later. But it's it is a, such a key differentiator that yeah, being focused on that I think is is great. So, but then that's okay. Responsiveness, in my definition, is two parts. One is is being fast, is being speedy, but without content, without something of value, you're not really being responsive. You know, if you can't resolve, you can't answer the customer's question. Yeah, you may get back to them quickly, but if you can't answer it, you haven't been responsive. It's almost like not answering at all. In fact, you might have been better off not answering, not not calling them back quickly if you didn't have something for them. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that um, I think that that's actually probably the next step, right? Is we have these tools that are putting information out there, know when the buyer is engaging with the information we're putting out there. When the buyer engages, it can alert the rep. The rep can see that they were the, that the buyer reacted to this. And I think the next step is giving the rep the tools about how to, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time nail it. And when they call that prospect, they say, you know, they have something to say that says, I think that you're at this part of your buying cycle. Um, you know, here is a common piece of information that people need. Is that interesting to you to the moment? Oh, you want something a little bit different than that, but we're down the right path. I think those will end up being great sales conversations, but I'm, I'm with you. I don't know that that's been solved for yet. Yeah, and another way to even think about it is, is certainly we tend now to think about content at stages. Another way I think that we'll have to go along with that is questions at stages. Because we right now we tend to focus on, as a sales entity, industry, whatever we want to call ourselves, is we tend to focus on questions in the discovery phase. And we tend to think of discovery as being sort of a one and done, where actually it's a continuous process throughout the sales process, or a buying process. So hopefully one of the first things we could do is say, yeah, 
this is not just the content they need, this is the questions they need at this stage. That's right. And that's why, um, I don't know how many of us do it that well, but that's why the whole concept of looking at the stages in your sales process, each has their own little mini sales cycle with exit criteria to move to the next stage, you know, plays right into what you're talking about. And if, if a rep is really following that in its genuine way, then they're going to have to ask questions all throughout the buying process because they're going to have to answer those questions to be able to exit whatever stage they're in to move to the next one. Yeah, and that's this metaphor of using uh, each stage as its own mini sales process or buying cycle, I think is the right one because I, I think one of the things, and we're sort of veering off track a little here, but the thing that a lot of reps don't understand is that is that the process of selling to a customer changes their needs. I think that's right. Because and as I think the customer becomes educated, they become more nuanced about what it is. And too often, I said, we get reps that get sort of stuck thinking that they're solving the pain point that they first uncovered, which as they get further into the process really isn't the primary pain point anymore. Uh, and and I'll, I mean, I think that's totally right. And I would even take it one step further and say that by uh, purchases are so much more of a collaborative thing in organizations now sure. that that the the pain point changes as you discover what people have influence in the process. So the set of I mean the the set of pain points that you could be solving for is hypothetically infinite depending on what you're selling and what organization you're selling it to. Yeah, well, I I draw the analogy and I wrote a few years ago an article saying that. Yeah, you know, in sort of the more complex B two B sale, it's it's really like Heisenberg's observer <laughs> effect and his principle of uncertainty is is by active observing or being in the process, we necessarily change it. That's right. And so, if we're not always alert to the possibility of change, then we're stuck back, and the customers will move beyond us. So, having systems that can help reps. Came back to the key point: <laughs> we can get the systems to the point where, and I don't know what the right data to capture has to be to provide the basis for it, but we have to get to that point where we give them more guidance and not just, you know, send an email, phone call, send this piece of content. It's really this contextual. This is really what they need from us right now. Yep. No, I, I totally agree with that. I, I mean, I would say it's better than it's ever been today. Yes. Again, going back to the signals, going back to being able to even understand how many, the different personas that are part of the purchase. Uh, the data exists better than it did even three years ago. Um, Absolutely. But it, but to your point, it's that next step of being intelligent about it and um, in, and participating with the buyer, right? And not just being a salesperson that's certain, uh, sitting back, you know, hey, if I can get this done today, are you ready to buy, right? That's right. We, no, it's, it's co-creation. Yeah, that's co right. Co-creation. So, yeah, it's it. Um, you and I were talking before we, we came on the air is, is that you know, the vast, vast majority of sales organizations are still at step one when it comes to automation and sales technologies. And for those who are listening who fit into that that audience, is, you know, you, we've talked about the sales stack, you know, which is a stack, if you will, or a list of, of application sales technologies to help you engage with your prospects better, you know, throughout the whole process as we've talked about. It's got to start somewhere, right? And... <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's just the easiest one. I mean, everybody has a CRM system. A lot of people, there's debate whether that really constitutes part of your sales stack or not. It's just like table stakes. But yeah, something as simple as, as email tracking, even though those applications aren't as simple as they used to be. But but just start there where you get some intelligence from your, your people you're reaching out for. Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, uh, the, the email technology out there is, is probably the easiest way for a sales organization to digest some of these signals about what's potentially important to the buyers and when it's important to them. The one thing I would caution is, is that um, I've seen the pendulum swing too far the other way with a lot of sales organizations where they get a little bit addicted to the email and um, <laughs> they, forget, they, they forget about the phone. And um, I think, I, I, I think the two work together perfectly. Absolutely. If, if all you're doing is calling, 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 you're not going to get very far. But similarly, if all you're doing is email and email and email, and you're missing a lot of opportunity as well. And so, yes, it's good to adopt the email technology, but don't forget about the phone. Oh, yeah. yeah I wasn't advocating that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, 
But it starts somewhere at the technology because yeah, in organizations certainly I think in the tech space, uh, you know, a survey that was done that the average according to sales ops, you know, they have five point five or something uh, sales enablement apps that they're using, but when they survey the sales reps, it's eleven. <laughs> <laughs> so you know there's this huge gap between because you know the reps are constantly looking for something to help them be better yeah so yeah. um help your help your reps be better <laughs> as i make the the plea to the audience and you know start small and we've had lots of guests on to talk about uh, how to help build your sales stack and what you should do go back some past episodes and listen to that but uh you get to a point then a system like philosophy philosophy based on the type of business you're doing, could potentially be a solution. Yeah, we hope so. And now in this last segment of the show, I've got some standard questions to ask the guests. The first one is a hypothetical scenario, which you're the star of, and that you, Josh, have just been hired as, as funny enough, VP of sales at a company whose sales have stalled out. And CEO and the board are anxious to get things unstuck, back on track now. We all know that you can't do a turnaround in a day, but your first week on the job, what two things could you do that would have the biggest impact? I think the first week on the job, if I could only do two things, um, I think one is I have to get to know the product. Um, the uh, Maybe it's just my personality or whatever. Um, but if I don't know how to sell the product myself, it's pretty hard for me to get my arm, my head around who I should be hiring, even what data and KPIs are important. You know, if I don't know what I'm selling, I'm just going to go back to how many phone calls are you making, and and we know it's more nuanced than that. So I w- I, I would want to spend time being able to learn how to sell the product myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the the second thing I would do if I can only do two things in the first week is I think I would um, hunt down the closed loss data um, because it's either going to show me that I don't have any um, or <laughs> which I think is vital right. um, or, or if I'm lucky enough to have it then and even if even if it's not great feedback in there I can pick up the phone and call 10 opportunities that were lost and interview them, uh, you know, with a couple questions around sales process stuff and a couple questions about what decisions they made with different products. Otherwise, I think that those are probably the two most important things to do in week one to figure out what to do in weeks two, three, and four. Okay, excellent answer. Yeah, and I can pretty much guarantee you that if a company of sales have stalled out, that <laughs> closed loss data is not going to be too, too easily available. <laughs> That's part of the problem. Hopefully, they at least know what opportunities they lost. But yeah, yeah, yeah. you're probably right. Some right. don't even have that. Right. Okay. So now some rapid fire questions. You can give me one word answers or elaborate if you wish. And the first one is when you, Josh, are out selling Philosophize products and services, what's your most powerful sales attribute? I think being genuine. It's, uh, it's really important to us at Philosophy to find customers that are good fits. Um, we, we take an approach and we're pretty open about that approach and we're okay if we don't end up selling a customer that doesn't agree with our approach. So we try to be very genuine in the sales process. Great answer. Who's your sales role model? Who is my sales role model? Um, guys. So I, I, the person that I always tell him he's my idol is Steve Richard, uh, now sure. of Exec of Exec Vision. <laughs> He'll like that. <laughs> I, I I love I love watching him engage with a group of people. Right. Uh, I w- if I can do half of what he does, um, I'd be pretty happy. Steve Richard, well, good. He'll be glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm talking to him in about a week. Um, what's the one book every salesperson should read? I think every salesperson has to read the Challenger Sale. Right, it's too it's too easy to tell people what they want to hear, and so for me, just always having in the back of my head that it's okay sometimes to just say, you know what, let me let me tell you a little bit about this, because I, I I am an expert on this. Um, I think that that helps. I think that helps a lot of salespeople. Okay. All right. Last question for you: What music's on your playlist right now? Uh, I like having uh, EDM, kind of the electronic mm-hmm. music in the background. Uh, it gives me energy when I work. 
uh, and it doesn't have a bunch of words that distract me. My favorite music is actually old school hip hop, but if I listen to that all day, I, will, I won't get anything done. <laughs> so when you've got the EDM going on in the background, if I were to turn the camera on on your laptop, would we see you dancing in your, your office? Um, sometimes. On a, on occasion, sometimes, okay. for sure, for sure, all for right. sure. I'm all not right. afraid. <laughs> Something to share on social. <laughs> So, well, Josh, I want to thank you for being on the show. Tell people how they can find out more about Velocify. I would go to our website, www.velocify.com, or please email me, J-E-V-A-N-S, at Velocify.com. Um, we love to talk about what we do. I, I always refer to myself as the luckiest sales manager on the planet because I truly get to think about sales and sales process all day long because it's not just what I do, it's what I sell. So Excellent. I love it. I love it. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. And remember, friends, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. An easy way to do that is to make this podcast accelerate a part of your daily routine, listening on your commute, in the gym, or as part of your morning sales meeting. That way, you won't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Josh Evans, who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining me. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.